Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Conversations That Count. I am Sri Lekha Pale, Vice Chair of Community, Strategy, and Engagement for Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District. As part of community engagement, I have been inviting community influencers, candidates, subject matter experts on conversations that count so they can shed light on most important topics that matter to you and me and the communities that we live in. This week, I have invited Carrie Lucas. She is the president of the Independent Women's Forum. She's also the senior fellow at the Goldwater Institute, a contributor to National Review Online and a columnist for Forbes.com. Before her tenure at Independent Women's Forum, Lucas worked for then US House of Representative Charles Christopher Chris Cox as a senior domestic policy analyst for the House Republican Policy Committee and the senior staff member of the Homeland Security Committee. Ms. Lucas earned her BA from Princeton University and her master's degree in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. As you can see, she's a very smart young lady. Previously, she worked at Cato Institute as a social security analyst. She has written several studies for the Cato Institute on social security and education policies. Her op-ed pieces have been published in, among other publications, in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and the USA Today. She is the author of the books, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Women, Sex and Feminism, Liberty is No War on Women, and Checking Progressive Privilege. That's actually my personal favorite. I must admit, Checking Progressive Privilege is my personal favorite. As I said, I've read that a couple of times. Ms. Lucas is a regular guest on Tom Hartman's show on the Air America Radio Network. And in May 2009, she even appeared on the ABC 2020 special produced by John Stossel. With, uh, without any delay, I would love to bring Ms. Lucas on this show, and I'm very excited to be talking to her. Carrie, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, Carrie, I am so very excited, as I was just talking to you right before we went live. Uh, uh, on first anniversary of Independent Women's Forum, I talked to multiple people, very excited, looking forward to meeting you. Unfortunately, I couldn't meet you that day, asking for to uh, get more information about you so I could bring you on the show. Uh, congratulations on the first anniversary of um, uh, Independent Women's Forum. For folks that don't know what Independent Women's Forum is, talk to us of what that is and uh, what, what about the mission? What exactly is the mission of Independent Women's sure. Forum? So, you know, it's interesting. We actually, Independent Women's Forum is uh, a public policy organization. It's kind of an educational um, we, uh, educational group, kind of like a, a think tank, a traditional think tank, where we have a lot of different scholars who cover different issues. Um, and we've been around for a while, for 30 years, but the, the first anniversary was that about a year ago, we launched something called Independent Women's Network, um, at which Independent Women's Forum has helped kind of stand up. Um, and that's really to get people in the community involved. And so that's a new venture. And I really think it's a it kind of is um, it speaks to what's happening in our country right now and really in our, our movement where for a long time there's been um, you know, a lot of people talking and talking about public policy, but now we realize that that's not enough. We need to not only talk about your know, issues are important, we need to have really um, important analysis and commentary and look into, dig into how issues impact people. But then we need a lot of folks on the ground <laughs> to get noisy. Um, and that's what Independent Women's Network is about. And, and that's really what's been a lot of fun and I think has been changed for me over this last year. And I've been really thrilled. I'm, I'm here in Fairfax County myself and um, and love um, you know, starting to get to know people because I hadn't really paid much attention to local government until these last couple of years, I think like a lot of folks. And now I'm hooked. <laughs> I want to I, I wanna also have a, you know, a role or have a presence here and, and know what's going on. Carrie, what, uh, what exactly motivated you to start? I mean, one day, did you just get up and say, hey, let me go ahead and get started with this? I know you kind of briefly mentioned that there were a lot of issues going on. I mean, I know it's kind of hard to peel on all the issues, but was there a particular moment you said, you know what, I'm go just going to do something about this? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because I feel like for, um, you know, I, as you, when you gave my very generous bio, you know, um, you can tell I've been working in kind of the public policy. I was bit with by the public policy bug when I was in my early 20s and became kind of a libertarian, read Ayn Rand, and went to the Cato Institute and started studying issues. And that's really been my focus 
um, for uh, you know, 20 some odd years. Um, I've been working for Independent Women's Forum itself for, for almost 20 years now. Um, but then it was really during COVID, um, you know, when I did have, you know, I've got five children in Fairfax County Public Schools. And when the schools were closed, um, and this was in, um, in the 2020, 2021 school year, when the schools were still entirely virtual, and I had every child in, the, in my house on a computer, that's when I started thinking like, what is going on with my school board? And who are the decision makers? And of course, um, I was watching at the same time, um, really the, the mini revolution that was going on with, um, with people in Loudoun County, and these leaders, these brave people, these brave mom and dads around the country who started speaking out and they started going to their school board meetings. Um, and, you know, I didn't, that wasn't for me until, you know, I didn't, I didn't start getting involved until the mask issue. That was kind of the final straw when I kind of sat on the sidelines, you know, written the emails and <laughs> done things like that. But I hadn't been motivated to really make a stand and really try to try to speak out until um, Fairfax County Public Schools refused to let kids take masks off. And um, my youngest my youngest son is seven years old. He had never been in school without a mask. And I thought it was so infuriating. So that's when I started kind of jumping into the local politics and local activism. Uh, Carrie, uh, uh, I think you wouldn't be surprised how many patient, parents uh, are irate at then and even now. So uh, Carrie, I do a lot of research when I bring in guests to my um, podcast. And I kind of like researched Independence Women Forum, looked into different chapters, spoke to several of your peers. And I see that Independent Women's Forum focuses on culture, economy, health, innovation, law, education, national security, politics, work, very relevant topics, especially now more than ever. But among these, uh, Carrie, I'm just curious to know what are the top three policies that you work on or just focuses on on a daily basis? If you wake up with uh, along with five children, you're like, okay, what are the top three things that you, you're like, let me just focus on them for this week today. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. So, um, so I am, you know, IWF now has um, over 30 employees. So I have a lot of just fabulous people who work on energy issues and the economy. Um, you know, I had always, um, when my focus over the last several years has been child care and paid leave policy. But honestly, um, I feel like in the last year or so, um, maybe a little longer than that, um, I, I've been motivated by a really one issue. Like one thing has really um, been something that's been uh, like a big focus and that's this, uh, um, the assault on the concept of women. Um, and I think that this is something, um, you know, again, I had been somebody who was much more focused on the economics and, you know, kind of dollars and cents and like numbers and things like that. And then um, when the, the drumbeat started happening of women being erased from law, when all of a sudden you had um, you know, the Bostock decision, there was a Supreme Court decision, which um, decided that discrimination law, um, sex discrimination included gender identity, which all of a sudden meant that men identifying as women were afforded like access to spaces that were meant for meant for women. Um, and um, you know, I, I consider myself um, you know, pretty libertarian about most um, about uh, most social issues and I'm um, but this one got to me. I said, I have teenage daughters, I've got three daughters. Um, I care a lot about um, about women's rights. And this was the first time where you know I felt very much like you know, um, like we were back in the 1970s and said, wait a second, you mean that you're going to ask these girls who have been you know, working so hard to be the best swimmers in the, um, in the country um, or these runners or in these contact sports or semi-contact sports like lacrosse, I have daughters who play lacrosse. Um, and all of a sudden a man, a guy, uh, like a male bodied athlete is going to come and ask them to, to step aside. Um, and that really got to me. And so certainly like right now, one of the big focuses at Independent Women's Forum is defending this concept of women. We launch something called the Women's Bill of Rights. Um, and it's very simple. It's a, um, it's a, and it's been um, introduced in the House and, and um, Congress now as a, um, as a resolution. We came up with kind of the model legisl model idea and this, um, and the wording, and now um, it's been turned into legislation. But um, all it does is codify the idea that women, the word woman, is biologically based and it defines woman as an adult female um, and male as this intrinsically biological um, state. 
you know, all these things, are, we need to make sure that, you know, just in the Violence Against Women's Act, the word woman is used over 200 times. We need to know what that word means, right? We need to, have, for, for a legal purpose, that really matters. So that's one of our really big focuses and priorities. Kerry, that is such a good thing that you're focused on. Kerry, believe it or not, in being in conservative world, I know this has been going on for a while, and I cared for it as much, and I thought at least I cared for it. And a few months back, I went to ACSM. It's a conference, American College of Sports Medicine, and I sat through a symposium focused on Title IX. And there was a lady that actually was an athlete that fought for while this Title IX was going on, who was an obviously seasoned, um, mature yeah. athlete. And I think that she inspired me to actually look into this issue. Um, it just really put me into a perspective of how much they fought for it to kind of make sure that the ladies really had a French seat on it. That made me think it, it took them so hard. They fought hard and long to get this and we can't let it go. We can't just yeah. let it, let a, any government come in and dilute the issue to this extent. Uh, so yeah. thank you all of you for being one of those um, leading power on this. Well, you know, it's been um, it's been so gratifying and it's actually, it's really interesting because this is one where um, you know, this isn't so much about being a conservative. This is about being somebody who believes in common sense and that um, words matter, that language matters. Um, and this basic concept of kind of fairness and just, you know, decency, um, you know, we brought together a lot of um, women, you know, a lot of conservatives, of course, but then also some from the principled left where we agree on very little <laughs> other than this idea that, um, that women are women and that it, it is not okay for men to be invited into their spaces. Um, you know, I thought it was really important. I've been really um, encouraged at um, how many people are coming out and, and now supporting these female athletes, you know, a year ago, um, people who spoke out, oh, those kind of early um, athletes who said, hey, you know, wait a minute, I don't think it's fair, I'm going to have to compete, I, this, you know, six foot two man has just en entered my, um, you know, my running competition that these, that they risk being canceled. Um, certainly the, when the University of Pennsylvania began allowing um, this, you know, formerly Will Thomas um, to come and start competing against uh, or playing on the women's sports, uh, women's swimming team, the, his, the, his, um, the women on that, that swim team were told that they should not complain, that if they risked losing their spot on the team, if they spoke up, this fully intact male-bodied athlete um, was all of a sudden in their rest of their locker rooms and getting changed in, um, in front of them. Um, he still dates women. Um, and so um, it sounds like he was pretty disrespectful to some of these girls. And it was a kind of thing that just was very... Um, galling and um anyway so we've we've been able to work with some of those athletes and help them get their voice out and kind of i think show them that they should speak out that yes there's going to be people who come and attack them and say terrible things about them on social media but who cares there's a lot of us out there also rooting for them good for you good for you i always say god bless you guys for being out there for us so uh carrie um let's talk about uh, some of these sectors be it manufacturing energy medicine education i mean innovative products right but there are these again government actions like regulations higher taxes uh, they reduce choice and discourage innovations what are your thoughts on that i mean does independent women's forum work on those things too you know, absolutely um you know we do we work um you we have always said um we have a saying that um all issues are women's issues and that sometimes um too many people want to pigeonhole women as only caring about things that have to do with with children and um and things like that but um but in fact women care intensely about things like energy policy um and energy and inflation are ones that you know women tend to be the ones who are dealing with you know we're the ones who get supplies and kind of keep the family budgets and are seeing right now just the, the really devastating impact um, that the country is suffering from because of our um, inflationary economic policies. Um, so absolutely, we, we care about those issues. You know, one of the ones that's close to my heart and that I focus a lot on um, um, in terms of pu public policy is, the, um, is this idea of what, what workplace flexibility means. Because um, it's unfortunate that um, a lot of the, the, of the government um, tends to want to mandate flexibility and say, yes, it's so important for women to have a flexible workplace. So we're going to say that every company has to offer women exactly this or their employees exactly this. 
And that is the opposite of flexibility. Um, what we really need and what women benefit from is when we have a robust economy where there's a lot of job opportunity and that women have the potential to customize their job. Um, and we can't pretend that, um, you know, there's often sometimes regulations which seek to, um, to make it impossible to reward people for working longer and harder. Um, and that's wrong, you know, um, you know, if you are a woman who chooses to step back and focus on your kids, which you know, I've done at different times, you know, there's like most people have, um, have made uh, you know, sacrifices in their careers for their kids, um, that's okay. And, and women, women are often willing to make trade-offs with, their, um, uh, with how much they earn and, and with their role in the workplace um, to have that flexibility. So that's one that's really um, uh, one I really enjoy and I think is, is important. It's amazing when you said the women's uh, issues are all issues, right? I mean, it's re uh, it's really not nice to say women's only focus on pro-life issues or they only focus on uh, this issues. I mean, I, I always say that we are what fifty-one percent of water base. Our yeah. our okay. issues are all issues. It need not be just childcare issues. It need not be just don't minimize what we do. Our exactly. issues exactly. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Although you know, it's interesting because I do want to mention childcare because I feel like that's another one that's um that's been such an important conversation over the last year because really there was almost a radical change um where the federal government was threatening to with build back the original build back better was threatening to have the federal government take over um, um a child care and really set the regulations and i thought that was such an incredibly dangerous move and i'm really proud of independent women's forums role in that because we started pushing back not just because it was really expensive of course it was insanely expensive and with money we don't have and would have um, heightened inflation even more. But really the thing that I worried about was that um, is that you you don't want to, the federal government becomes the sole funder of child care, basically carries the purse strings. Um, they are going to be setting the decision on curriculum and every problem we see in our K through 12 schools today um, from you know bad teacher quality, from um, you know, disciplinary problems with the politicized cur um, curriculums, um, you know, the gender stuff, you're, that would all be coming down to, K, to zero through five. Um, it, was, it was madness, given all the problems we have with our elementary and secondary schools to say, oh yeah, let's double down on that and have the government in charge of our one-year-olds. It's, um, it's crazy. So that's something I think we really need to speak clearly about. There's a lot of ways to help parents with little kids. Having a, a federal takeover of, of childcare is completely um, not what our country needs. Absolutely not. Parents should be responsible for their children. For sure. <laughs> exactly. So, Carrie, uh, I've watched a lot of your videos. Uh, I, I know you have been actually doing these interviews for what a decade or two at this point. Uh, um, so, you you have spoken a lot about culture when no one was speaking about culture. Um, apparently, our culture also pressurizes as women to subscribe to certain ways of thinking. Those who deviate from politically correct thinking risk being canceled. I think um, you spoke about cancer culture before the word cancel even existed. Yeah. This cancer culture thre uh, threatens civilized discourse. So it shouldn't come as a surprise then that sadly diversity of thought is often missing in the mainstream media. What do you think? Is this a new phenomenon? But I've heard you spo speak about it even five years back. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. I really think this is like a fascinating topic. Um, and I'm actually encouraged. I think we've um, we're at a point where things are getting a little bit better. For, for years, I think for, you know, for as long as, um, you know, for decades now, everyone has talked about the idea of this um, liberal media bias, this idea that um, you know, for, for as long as there's been network TV, that they had a slant towards, um, you know, democratic candidates or gave um, favorable coverage to kind of a more liberal perspective. I think that's happened for, forever. Um, you know, I, a few years ago, um, wrote this, the, um, this little, it's a, really a booklet that, um, that you mentioned on, um, on progressive privilege, because I thought it was interesting um, putting it in context of kind of using the left's language, um, you know, and to, not to, <laughs> to dig, dig too deep into this, but um, I read one of the original pieces what, where the concept of privilege was discussed, and it was written by a, a white woman um, and she described like the privilege of being white. And this was written in like the, in the 1980s. And I was all prepared to kind of dismiss it and say, ah, this is nonsense or whatever, because it had been so kind of um, stretched by, um, by 19, uh, 20, um, 2019 when I was looking at this. But actually I found a lot of it made some sense. You know, this idea of, of the, um, 
of the fact that, um, you know, that, um, that when you walked into the toy aisle, that there was all these like white dolls and that um, the skin cream for, you know, as a woman, if you walk in to get a foundation that, you know, that most of them matched my color and it was, um, you know, it was more Caucasian. And there was all these things where I thought, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And that there is this, like the having, being the dominant culture made it so um, that this is something that I should be aware of as privilege. But if you look at, if you look at that and how now today, um, the way that conservatives are treated, um, you know, we are truly like lacking privilege um, and it's a liberal, um, you know, I, th I think, of, excuse me, a back to school night or something where you're in a, a room of parents and how, um, you know, I would go into some place and somebody would like proudly have an Obama shirt or now you'll see something with like an obscene statement about Trump or people talk very confidently about um, how right they are um, about with all of their positions. I feel like for a long time, conservatives were encouraged and really felt as though we had to keep our head down or we were going to be tarred as racist, homophobic, sexist. We were bad. If you, um, we had to, we were guilty until proven innocent. And we had this baggage where we were seen as, um, you know, we, we had a, like a barrier to overcome when you're meeting two people. That's the definition of privilege. Progressives have this privilege that conservatives didn't have and would have to earn. So I think it's important to like for, I think that's like kind of helps in putting it in a language that they should be able to understand. And now I think with cancel culture, it's been taken to a whole new level, but it's so outrageous that I think a lot of people are saying enough, you know, we can't just, we can't just, um, this is not how discourse is supposed to be. And you don't want people um, being tossed out and judged um, and, yeah, and and it removed from from polite society when they for one you know one awkward phrase or whatever um, or for an unpopular idea. Absolutely, Carrie. I want to go back to one thing that you told about choices. I think you just mentioned about uh, choices and greater flexibility and so on and so forth. I think we should celebrate those choices and find ways to improve opportunities uh, so each woman can pursue their own vision of happiness uh, without government dictating or boxing us and saying, these, these are the choices you should be making. And I think um, I, you also basically mentioned that government is re reforming things or expanding government programs. But instead of uh, expanding government programs and dictating for us, what do you think policymakers can do or find ways to give us more options? So we have the more freedom to decide or give us compensations or how can they provide us more resources and how can they give us more freedom? Yeah. You know, what is important for our families? You know, I, 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 um, that's such a, that's such like a fundamental and important question. And I do think um, the number one thing they can do is start getting out of the way. Um, you know, if you look at something, um, you know, it was interesting when I was recently researching um, for testimony I was doing on, um, on the childcare question, I went sort of going through some of the regulations that are out there that govern like home daycare centers. And you would be, it's, it's sickening when you look at some of the, the, the hoops that people jump through when they want to start a daycare center. And that means, you know, housing five, six kids in your house um, to care for them in your home. Um, the, the, the minutia that was regulated, things like how many balls of what sizes you have to have, specifically, you know, specific toys you have to have. Um, all of these things where a house, like, you know, I've got five kids in this house and right now there's more kids running around, they're, they're friends. Um, and my house would never be able to pass that standard to open a, a, um, a daycare center. And yet we wonder why daycare is so hard to find in so many parts of the country and why, um, and why it's so expensive. Well, it's because of these terrible regulations which push providers out and make it really impossible for, um, for entrepreneurs to enter the business. So that's just one example, but I think that's, that's um, replete throughout our economic system where we do have just mind boggling layers of unnecessary regulation, um, which raise costs. Um, you know, I worry that anything that the government does to start trying to incentivize um, workplace flexibility is going to, um, is going to backfire. Um, so that's why I really think removing them is getting back to this idea that government regulation should only be to protect against true safety and security and exploitation issues. Um, and then letting people find, um, uh, you know, find opportunities that work for them. And, and you're right that there's so much we are, you know, for all of the bad what, that we talk about and we see in our uh, um, country and our culture today, we are so lucky, especially, especially as women, um, you know, being able to have the option to work from home, 
technologies that make it so, and, you know, even if you are mostly an office worker, the fact that you can say, oh, I, you know, I'm going to jump on the phone call instead while I pick up my kid um, and everybody gets this. Women are powerful workers now. You don't have to explain to somebody that you need to go pick up your kid because they probably have a working mom too or a working dad and know about these things. That's very different than, um, than even, um, you know, when I was starting out as a, as a young person to, um, in the office 20 years ago or 25 years ago, that was, it was much rarer that you were going to see a working mom in that situation. Now it's completely common. So um, we have so many new paradigms of working. We should really celebrate that and then encourage it more. Absolutely, Kiri. And I also think that we bring such unique uh, a perspective to critical issues ranging anywhere from healthcare to national defense to education. I think we need to be celebrated without being feared of being shamed or mocked or silenced. Uh, and I think we have such great potential for leadership positions. And I just don't think uh, we are being explored as much as we should be. Yeah. Um, uh, Carrie, I really, really like the books. I was telling you the books that you have written. Um, I, I want to explore a little more about um, the Checking Progressive Privilege. I think it's a thought-provoking book that challenges us to rethink privilege. Uh, my question to you is, can privilege expand beyond race, gender, and sexual orientation to include worldviews? If, if so, is there such a thing as progressive privilege? I know you spoke a bit yeah. about it, but I would love for you to expand on it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and again, it was interesting when I first started like researching for this book, I was very much prepared to kind of dismiss this concept entirely. Um, and then instead, I, I did start thinking like, no, there is, there certainly are privileged categories and, um, and privileged positions that we all hold and, um, and things that are, you know, things that people get dealt different hands and some are easier than the others. And that's just, you know, that's just the truth. And we all have to make do with what we, with what we have. Um, but certainly today when we're looking at kind of those different, um, um, how these things stack out and how we're treating, trying, striving to treat people as individuals and not pigeonholing them and, and making it possible for people to use their time and talents um, to their fullest potential. Certainly right now, um, there is a, a bias against, there, or there's an um, ideological privilege is, is certainly when you look at how um, in colleges in particular, in particular if you look at like grad schools, like who is being allowed to um, kind of become elevated in grad schools and who is being allowed to become the tenured professors and get these cushy jobs. Frankly, then it's not even just in academia. Now we see in, in, um, in companies where they literally are starting to have boxes um, and it Honestly, as a woman, it makes me sick to think that, that there's like a, a box that say like, oh, we need a we need a girl for that one. So therefore, like, we're going to choose you, which is just, it's so depressing because it makes it impossible for us to win because we're not even allowed to compete on a fair playing field because we know we're part of a rigged game. So, um, so I think that there's, um, that this concept of privilege is backfired in some way as people have, have tried to like address privilege by making by by elevating the quote unprivileged and giving them new space, and then certainly the the true bias and true prejudice against um, against uh, people with um, conservative or non not liberal viewpoints is certainly a problem that we see throughout our economy and, and our culture. So, Carrie, in America, let's talk about not only I mean I work in um, organizations and all of us do at this point in all aspects of our life. We value diversity and we should. Uh, but in certain, uh, let's say if you walk in the campus, I mean, our, my kid goes to a campus. You know, I mean, we, uh, we strive to find a single black person, a non-Christian, a gay person. You want to uh, find uh, different uh, representation of uh, modern America. Yet on many campus, you may not want, you will, may not find a registered Republican. So <laughs> <laughs> in almost every academic, especially campuses, you find only li uh, liberal faculty members. Why is that? Uh, why is there not a conscious effort being made to find a conservative uh, counterparts? What can you, what can we do to change that? Yeah. Other than having this good discussion. Yeah. You know, I do think, I think that the number one thing is to have discussions like this and start and get noisy about it, to start complaining, start talking. You know, I, um, you know, I'm, you kindly read my bio where I, you know, I went to Princeton, I went to Harvard, and I wouldn't give those places a dime. I, I, I would never, um, I would never, like, I, um, I don't, I, I think we should stop, we should um, stop giving money to um, higher educa education institutions that are um, completely hostile to, um, 
to our values and to, and to ideological diversity. I think that these places are now actively trying to make the country a worse place. Um, and, um, and are really are like prejudice against, um, against conservatives in a way that um, we shouldn't patronize, that that's not, it's not okay. And I think we need to have those, those conversations and speak very clearly about that. Um, um, you know, it's interesting. I remember back when I was in grad school um, that and I was at this, you know, 60 class of 60 and they were having a discussion on um, it was supposed to be an ethics class on abortion. And they literally had this class of 60. There was like no one who was willing to stand up and make the principled pro-life position. And that should be something that anybody should be able to do if you have paid attention enough in the same way, you know, you and I would know the pro um, the pro choice argument. We know what, what they say. We, you, know, you should be able to know what the what um what these the different sides of are. And it's it's bad for, it's not just not fair, it's not just discriminating against conservative students and conservative you know, thinkers and potential professors. It's, it's really robbing everyone of an education because those kids who are sitting there and just in a complete echo chamber of woke leftism, you know, they're, they're not being served by their university. They are not learning critical thinking and how to argue and how to, um, how to see through another person's eyes. Um, um, you're right that this it's it's just it's embarrassing how much their focus on diversity has become the most obvious and really it's in so many ways the most trivial um, things of like you know what's your skin pigmentation and um, and that's how we're going to judge diversity instead of you know, life experiences and um, viewpoints and belief systems. I mean, this is um, you know it's it is it's it's sad, I think, what's happened to our university system. And we gotta keep calling them out because um, there's lasting consequences. We've, we ignored it for too long and now we're reaping the fruits of it today. So Carrie, I think you, well, if I heard you right, you said do not buy, boycott them, talk about it, give a pushback. Yeah. Don't, give them, them. don't, yeah, don't give them your money. Don't them. Don't give them your money. Yeah, don't, don't I get these, these, um, I, you get these fundraising letters from uh, from your alma mater and, um, and if they're if they're bad, you don't do it just out of habit because there's so many great causes out there for heaven's sakes um, that are more deserving than these um, you know, bloated money wasting. The fact that this student loan just went through makes me so angry when I think of Harvard sitting there with, what is it? Billions and billions of dollars. billion dollars, I think. Yeah, I mean, they should pay this. Why is, why is the, you know, the hardworking um, you know, electrician and plumber, why are they gonna get charged or have $2,000 of, of national debt on their head for these, you know, to bail out these, um, you know, <laughs> increasingly evil um, higher education institutions that hate them, don't respect them, and then are trying to teach um, students um, to, you know, to despise our country. So, absolutely, anyway, I get mad about that one. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, one other thing that I also tell folks is do not to uh, not uh, shy away from writing articles or writing blogs in these mainstream medias too. Go on to them versus boy boycotting them. Because if you boycott them, then you're really, you don't have a voice at all. Then you're kind of speaking to choir. You're only talking amongst yourself. I said, go on the my mainstream media and talk to them as well. What do you think of that? Oh, absolutely. I think we need to, um, to speak anywhere you can. I think that you should be, um, and realize, I think that one of the things that is another kind of wonderful development over the last year or two is um, how many people realized um, how big a difference a cup like being um, being willing to go out there you think about all of these people and I'm so impressed you I came very late to the game in terms of, of speaking out at, at schools when I look at people like you know Asra Namani Nicole Solis out in, in Rhode Island um, you, all the folks Ian Pryor and all the great um, team out there in, um, in Loudoun who started just not being afraid not being afraid to um, not being afraid when they got a lot of hate and um, and just kept kept the pressure on um, and there's been real impact. There's, there's impact here in Virginia in terms of how many people decided to um, reject the, um, you know, the teacher union candidate and um, and vote for um, for Governor Youngkin. But then there's been an impact, um, you know, really around the country of, of people starting to to make a change. So yeah, everybody everybody has the potential to be a reporter, a journalist. You've got a phone, you've got a camera. Um, you've got the ability to write and to publish yourself um, both on mainstream things and then also just in the, using social media platforms. Absolutely. So, Carrie, I'm glad you brought up Asra Namani. I, I really enjoy her writings. I enjoy 
what she say, what she has to say and so on and so forth. So you're a mother of five children in Fairfax County Public Schools yourself. I always say good education encompassing not just those three R's, right? Reasoning, resilience, and responsibility. You got to have those civics and character traits as well. So what do you think is going on around here in schools? Uh, do you think our K-312 education, higher education, is, is that providing good opportunities for every child or... Uh, Oh, uh, what, what do you think is going you on? You know, it's, it's certainly not doing all that it could. Um, and I want to, you know, it's funny. I always hate when I, especially when you're doing something on a, a quick TV thing on um, a Fairfax County Public Schools, you don't have time to say, I know that I know personally, there's a lot of great teachers out there. And I love some of my kids' teachers. And there's part of my kids' education, which is so good. And we've got so many great students and um, great parents who are involved. But man, I'm the, the school board is, um, is doing everything they can to undermine that and to... Um, and to distract from what should be the core of education. Um, and that's that's what's so frustrating. Um, you know, there's a lot of good in the schools, but then there's so much unnecessary bad. Um, you saw it this week when you looked at some of the, um, you know, it came out and I'm, I love that there was um, a whistleblower or somebody who took pictures of the training material that was being forced upon um, Fairfax County Public School teachers um, uh, that came, that was showed how they were being in, instructed to keep gender identity issues from, from, from parents, which is insane. You know, literally I get a, my really nice, lovely, um, the school nurse at our, my local um, elementary school, she calls um, you know, every time my daughter bumps her knee at recess and needs a Band-Aid or, you know, somebody bangs into somebody else and they need um, an ice pack. I get a phone call so that they know, hey, your kid had to come to the nurse, here's what happened, no big deal, but just, I am obliged to tell you this. Well, I frankly don't even really care about my kids bumped me or the fact that he, he or she needed an ice pack, but I would care intensely if they were considering, you know, changing their gender identity or were going through this, you know, having these massive um, questions about, about themselves. Um, and yet that is what these schools are actively trying to keep from parents and keep treating parents as if they're the enemy. It's crazy. I um, mean, it shows a hostility to parents that I think is totally inappropriate. Absolutely, Kerry. Kerry, I, I can't let you go without asking a little, a couple more questions as a follow up about Indian Women. I'm sorry, um, Independent Women's Network. Yeah. So, uh, so how do if uh, if any parent that is listening to this would like to get involved, how do they get involved in Independent? Yes. Network? Well, please come. You can just go online to um, iwnetwork.com um, and you can see. You know, basically, you need to give an email, and then you can get into our community and um, you'll start seeing that we have some chapter meetings around um, around here. We hold events. Um, we encourage people to take action. You know, I was able to encourage some folks to start, you know, writing to the school board and complaining about um, masking policies um, and connected with just some great people. I've met so many wonderful um, people around Fairfax County who've um, you know, got one of our emails from, um, from Independent Women's Network and started getting involved and working to, to change things. So you know, this is just, um, we do have, we've got, we just started out, we've got chapters, um, uh, we've got about 20 chapters around the country now, a couple thousand members, and we're just trying to make a difference and work with each other so we can, um, you know, so we can, it can get active both on a local level and a national level. So if they want to open a chapter for themselves, I know yeah. there are already several chapters. Uh, can they just join in with the chapter or can yeah, they open their absolutely. own chapter? You sign up with your email and you find out who is, um, who, where, if there's some, some place near you. And if there's something close, you can start going to that chapter meeting or you can certainly start a chapter, um, you know, wherever you are. And we've got people to help support and make that happen. Excellent. And also uh, one, one last question for you, um, Carrie. I'm a healthcare professional. So whoever comes in, I, I, I'll definitely have to ask. I know one of the policy questions that I had in Independent Women's Forum is uh, uh, overall, as you know, healthcare po poses a very high cost burden for Americans because we lack a competitive, transparent patient center marketplace. And structural reform is needed. And I see that Independent Women's Forum has been focused on healthcare. What are, what are you guys currently currently doing about healthcare reform? You know, it's interesting. You know, I feel like healthcare is one of those that's um, it's such a, a hard issue. It's so hard to make progress. I feel like ever since um, um, Obamacare happened, um, you know, we've been just on this slow, not so slow, kind of a steady march in the wrong direction with there being less transparency, 
um, less competition, more people really pushed onto the government roles. Um, and I think that's something that we, we try to talk a lot about is um, helping people understand that increasing Medicaid roles isn't good, that that's not what we want, that when people are on Medicaid, they have worse health outcomes than when they're uninsured. Um, that the more people we put on Medicaid, the more people um, don't get seen um, who, you know, safety nets are supposed to help those who really, really need it. And if everybody's in a safety net, that means that there's many fewer resources for each individual person. And I think that's what's happened a lot with Medicaid. So we try to talk about the need to pull, like to try to pull people out of Medicaid, help them get into the private market, increase price transparency. That's something that we've talked, that um, we write a lot. Um, but you know, I, I think healthcare is one where, um, what, how you described it was perfect, that that's the vision of where we need to go. It's just really hard to get people to understand the steps. It's so easy for the, the, um, the left and the, the powers that be that want a one size, you know, a government run single payer system to demonize anything that moves in that direction. So we're trying to, to keep the drumbeat of, um, of why we do need market-based, um, a transparent, competitive healthcare for the good of everyone and to keep safety nets reserved for those who really need it and not just make everyone in the safety net. Um, so, but it's tough as I'm sure you know. I think something you said, price transparency is the way to go. I think that's what is uh, lacking in the healthcare system. I think it's extremely important for consumers to kind of understand going into the hospital of what they're going to be paying for uh, before they can make a choice of what, uh, what really, if, if they want to get the test or not, especially if it is an elective procedure, they just really need to understand the co cost of the healthcare system. Yeah, it's, it really is. I do think it's one of those that I, I wish we could have a more of a conversation in this country to say, you know, why is it that this is the one time where you never get an estimate up front. You know, I wouldn't have anybody, you know, you, you ask before basically everything, how much is this, you know, somebody's gonna fix my car, how much is that gonna cost? And, you know, if, how much is this gonna cost to have the, your house address? Everything, we always know, you, you see a menu, you know, you know how much it's gonna cost. You don't come in, eat everything you can, and then say, and then say, oh, like, you know, what's this bill? And then, oh good, somebody else is gonna pay it. And yeah, that's why we have um, how healthcare works. We never see a menu. We never have any sense of trade-offs when it comes to um, comes to cost. And then we all wonder why healthcare is so dang expensive. You know, absolutely. But, yeah. So, Carrie, where do you see Independent Women's Forum go in five years? Where do you see yourself? Oh my gosh, Forum. Yeah, you know, it's or been, even I've, in two years for that matter. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I, one thing I've I've realized is that um, I never would have thought five years ago that we'd be so focused on defending this core concept of the word woman. Um, so you know, I really and you know, obviously, COVID was a threw everybody for a loop. So who knows where what's going to um, come at us from um, from left field? Um, but I really do see us as really focused on not just being a group of, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud. I love all of the, my great scholars that are doing like really hard work and are thoughtful and educated and are testifying before Congress and doing really important kind of thought work. We wanna do that and expand more. My big focus is helping more normal people, especially women, find their voice, find where they can have an impact, help them have the courage and the resources they need so they can make a difference where they are. Because I do think that this, this battle is not going to be won with anyone, um, you know, any big policy change or any success um, coming from Washington. It's going to be just, you know, every single little town out there having positive changes happening where they live. Um, so that's why we need to get as many people involved. So I'm hoping we can have thousands and thousands of very smart, thoughtful activists um, making a difference. Absolutely, Kerry. We, I have no doubt that with your enthusiasm and intelligence uh, and the will and the grit and perseverance, I can only see it uh, that you'll be doing such great work with women. And please note that since you are in Fairfax County, Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District will back you up uh, no matter what you want to do. And I'm very passionate about healthcare and women in general. Yeah. And uh, I will be more than happy to assist you in anything that you would like to pursue in healthcare industry. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, you really did not know much about the work that we were willing to do, but you were willing to come in and join us on this podcast and spend time uh, with us. We appreciate you and the great work that you are doing on behalf of uh, Independent Women's Network. Well, thank you so much. And I, I love this and I appreciate everything you're doing for, for this district and for this county. So, um, so thanks and thanks to any, everybody who joined in.
Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you all viewers for joining us on this Friday evening. We look forward to uh, bringing in this uh, 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 great speakers and to look forward to your engagement as well. We also will have another great session next Friday on uh, sep Friday, September 9th. We'll skip a week. We'll have a great labor uh, weekend, hopefully next weekend. And we will see all of you on Friday, September 9th at 5.30 p.m. with hands Juan Spakovsky, hopefully I said that right, is an attorney and the manager of Heritage Foundation's Election Law Reform Initiative. Hope all of you will tune in at this point. Have a wonderful weekend. God bless America. God bless you all and have a great evening. Thank you again.